Hi, and welcome to Have a Chat. I am your host today, Veronique Arsenault, and I'm joined by my most wonderful co-host, Judy Lozier. And so nice to be with you on this beautiful day, Veronique, and welcome to all of our viewers. I know we've been, it's, uh, the weather is getting better and I, we're getting closer to spring and I, I can't wait. Beautiful lately. We'll take it. We'll run with it. And it's March and that we spoke about it already. There's that new um, kick in everybody's step, I think. It's been a long haul. So finally, we're, we're getting that little sense of, um, you know, upstart to a new season and uh, people have a little bit more of a smile on their face lately, I find. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know what, Judy, we're going to kick off the show with your um, positive quote or your, yeah, your positive quote of the day. Yeah. So you take it away now. Certainly. Okay. This is by Karen Samuelson. Sometimes you just need to talk about something, not to get sympathy or help, but just to kill its power by allowing the truth of things to hit the air. What do you think? Love that. Love that. And it's, and then you're so right, Judy. It's, um, you know, oftentimes uh, we just don't know that people just need to be able to vent, to have that space and, and be able to just express how they're feeling, whether it be frustration or joy mm -hmm. or whatever it is. And so um, I love that, you know, sometimes it, you just need, you just need to say it so that it, it's not buried in your head anymore and, and taking up space. And don't you find, I've been thinking about this lately with a lot of people, for example, on my online community Facebook page, which I have for the anti-bullying and other issues uh, that we're trying to attain awareness of, mental health and supporting one another. People are saying, well, how do I deal with this problem? How do I approach this person? I've analyzed that a few times. And what I tell them now is ask, just whether it's discreetly or forthrightly, ask just ask the question that's burning in your heart because there's nothing somebody wants to answer them that that what they've been wanting to say for so long but they're, they're, they're not wanting to if somebody's not going to directly initiate that Do you know what i'm saying veronique if if they don't if they're saying that they're very anxious and and we don't say tell me how you're feeling lately are you feeling anxious during the covid uh, period are you feeling anxious about this or that your new job it's not allowing them to actually if they're a little bit uncomfortable with their feelings have that opportunity. So I'm just asking people now, and I, I'm taking my time and not being rude about anything. But if I want to know something, which I didn't do before, I was playing guessing games. I'm coming right out and saying, so tell me, what 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 are you doing, or what are you feeling, or and and then I'm getting my honest answer from them. It might there might be a brick wall up there at first, but with genuine interest and a back and forth gentle conversation, I find we're on the same page a lot of the time lately with with my relationships. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, um, and, and you're right, you know, we, we have to take that, that power into our own hands. And something that I've started doing lately, um, along the same lines, is when someone comes to me and they say, you know, I, I need, I need to talk to you about this, either I'm frustrated or whatever. And mm -hmm. I've started, started leading with, um, do you, are we fixing this? Like, do you need solutions? Or you, or do you just need to, to say it out loud? Um, because you yeah. know, we have that, that feeling of wanting to fix everything for our friends and mm -hmm. family. Um, when mm -hmm. in, in reality, just like your quote said, sometimes they just needed to give it a voice. And so, you know, mm -hmm. if I know that up front that I'm not meant to be finding a solution to whatever it is that we're talking about, and then I'm just here for you to be able to share whatever, yeah. however it is that you feel, then that's, then that changes my strategy. Right. And, and so I, that's something that I've started to do. And, you know, a lot of that came out of being uh, of that awareness that you're creating with your J connection. So, um, you know, I'll thank mm -hmm. you for that. Well, you're very welcome. So let that word just the truth hit the air. And then that just kind of dispels any tension on the on the topic at the moment. Yeah, yeah, I liked it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Um, so <sighs> the biggest bombshell interview last week, of course, happened. And uh, that was, and everybody's been talking about it for days and days on end. Um, and that is the huge interview with Megan and Harry and Oprah. Um, you know, wow. Wow is right. I was very much hoping that they did things the way they did when they were going to be interviewed. And that was not to lash out, attack the monarchy. 
and, and, and our beautiful queen that has served so respectably and one of the most admirable people um, that I've ever known of in history. She's just amazing. And, you know, it's such an empire and, and, and such a, a, a beautiful institute as far as her reigning. And she's 90, what, how many years old? 90 some years old. And that's the life she's led. And, and like I said, full on respect for her. I was hoping they would not bring anything out that was downright dirty or, uh, you know, malignant towards them. And they didn't. I, I really felt that they were very gentle in their whole open conversation. And I really think that Oprah was the person. She is the most uh, well-known name on the planet as far as people that are interviewing and journalists, uh, public figures, that types of conversations on a world stage platform. Everybody knows who she is. So she was, and I love how she asked, just as I said earlier, certain, she asked a question, some things just hit the air, but she also asked those questions that were on our mind. And I personally, like I said, did not want her ever to attack or harry the, the, the monarchy, the queen and family, the royalty, but I did really want to hear her truth. She's been um, living a life that she's not been able to talk about and yet she's been uh, she's been so torn apart and defamed as far as the press goes and um the the gossipers and everybody else that have judged her on this that and everything should not why well, shouldn't she tell her side uh, she wasn't getting paid to do the interview she has given up it's not like she's lost anything she's she chose to leave uh oprah of course made money her her harpo studio company would make a huge profit off of this interview but they themselves did not prince harry nor uh megan markle the questions were spontaneous there was no leading up to anything as far as rehearse goes and i my initial reaction was i was very very nervous for what was to come i was a actually anticipating a very much of a nail biter and i did sense that worried apprehensive tension in Megan when she first sat down, not knowing what was coming at her. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, what struck me is that, um, you know, they, they obviously still have a, a, a huge amount of respect and love for the queen as, as his grandmother. Um, they, they talked about her quite reverently and I thought that that was lovely. Um, you know, I, I guess I have a lot of compassion for, um, those who find themselves in, in situations uh, like the queen herself. And I listen, I get it. Mm -hmm. She's got servants. She's got, you know, she's, uh, I mean, rolling in her own money, you know, all of that stuff. But she has lived her entire life, her entire 90 years, you know, 90 plus years mm -hmm. um, in service to others, right? So yeah, in her young yeah. years, she was preparing for the crown. And then she has held that crown for, you know, the longest reigning mar monarch in history. And, and, yeah. and I have such compassion for her because every aspect of her life is scheduled, you know, by other people and by duty and, you know, and, and she, she does over 300 appearances a year, right? So if you think there's 365 mm -hmm. days a year, you know, some days she's at two or three uh, events or appearances. So I, I have a huge amount of compassion for her. And, and at the end of the day, it seems to me just the way they talked about her, that she's still such a grandmother at heart, um, you know, in her interactions with uh, Megan and Prince Harry and, and the babies and all that. So mm -hmm. anyway, I, I, it was, it was a very interesting interview. I, you know, everybody around the world was pretty, um, pretty glued to the TV, I think. I'm with you on the queen, Veronique. There's nobody I can think of that is more deserving of respect and admiration than her. And I think that there's like, I have not heard anybody ever speak otherwise about her. And I, mm -hmm. it, it saddened me. It really did sadden me. But I, I personally, they say that Diana was, you know, um, her life was so unhappy. And I really do think that Megan, they say that Megan wasn't naive, that she was very uh, in tune with what was going to be a part of her role. I, I disagree with that. I think she was innocent to a lot of it. I think she acted very green. Um, she she said she didn't even know that she should have known. She should have researched it more, but she said, I honestly didn't look into all that it would entail, all that I would be restricted upon, and all that I would have to do in the run of a day, as in do not do this, do not do that. And basically, I think the girl was, she was in for rude awakening. Now, I think the bottom line is she fell in love with, with Harry. 
And no matter what was mm -hmm. going to happen, she was going to give that a try. I think she just, it wasn't about being married to a prince. She was a person in her own right. And what I think made me feel really good towards her was when she said, I do not need a title. I do not need to be Prince Harry's wife, part of royalty. I do not need to be known as an actress, which she, she was and is for the starring role uh, that she played in Suits on television and for all of the other. She said, my, the title I want to own is mom. And my son and my happiness and my family come before anything. And I think in life that I respect that choice that you have one life to live on this earth and that she was going to try to make a go of it. And after so much time, she felt with her mental health issues, which I truly believe she had. I do believe she had. Um, she was pregnant at the time that all of this kind of unraveled about her mental health and her breakdown and suicidal ideational thoughts. And so that chemistry and, and that would play into her feelings as well as being what she stated kind of in a, a locked, non-supportive system, um, names. She, she referred to the firm and the institution without beating up on anybody. She didn't do that. But I, I feel for her and Harry that they're a young couple in love. And if it meant for him walking away to support and protect the woman he loved and the children that she was bearing to him and them as a family and have a, a, a unity in life, I, I say I think they did the right thing myself. I, I, they, if they had knocked down the queen and her family, I would have been appalled. But they didn't do that. So I had no mm -hmm. problem with what she yeah. had to say. And I was very dismayed at Piers Morgan uh, from Good Morning Britain when he walked off and stormed off the set. I mean, grow up. Grow up. Mm -hmm. This man has beaten up, beaten up on the British press. He's beaten up on the government over there. He's beaten up on the royal family themselves. And he has a personal thing and dislike for Meghan Markle. He called her Princess Pinocchio, claiming her lies were there about mental health. I didn't, I thought he was extremely immature. And to leave the set in the middle of an interview and storm off like that, I say goodbye. Good, good riddance. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm hmm. Yeah, well, uh, apparently he is no longer with Good, Good Morning Britain. So, um, you know, that was, uh, I guess, that that uh, ending moment for his career. But, um, you know, um, w there's this thing that happens twice a year every year. And, and uh, it, it's, it's something I completely and totally despise. And that's the time change. <laughs> spring oh. forward. Spring forward happened over the weekend. And I, I absolutely despise everything about it i don't understand why we still have it i don't understand um you know what purpose it serves anymore and it it nearly kills me twice a year when we have to change the time me too veronique and it it you know our circadian rhythm is so mine's off anyway i did try melatonin in the natural formula not long ago just to reset myself and it did give me a little bit of a you know natural supplement to give me some sleep but then you feel like you're almost hung over or something from it so I'd rather not even take that but you're right it's another change to our system it's another getting used to just being off and the clock always does affect me when it when it goes forward or we go back to you know when we change a period I'm always off for about at least two weeks and I think people are saying the same thing that they're affected in some little way at least some way yeah, absolutely. And I think I read somewhere and I don't I don't even know where I got this, but uh, that the, the Monday after the time change, no matter whether it be, you know, fall back or spring forward is the the worst day for accidents um, all over the world. Yes. Like, because people are just yes. not I like I can't stand it. I and of course, the older I get, the crotchetier I get. But I, I just find that it, especially the spring forward one, for whatever reason, just throws me right off. It's funny you should mention the word crotchety because I don't know if it's just that we're coming out of winter into a new season or that COVID's really taken its, its toll on people for the most part. But I find society is getting really angry in general. I find it's the behavior of people shocking and I didn't used to see it like that. I found people, for the most part, you would have your personalities that were strong, irate, in your face. They're, they're always going to be there, and they always were. But, but I don't get this, uh, this, this venomous personality that's coming out in a lot of people that I've never seen before. Are you with me on this? Yeah, I think, you know, I think, you're, I think you touched on it. I think um, winter is hard anyway, and then you throw in, uh, COVID and the changing, you know, dynamic that that's had uh, on our lives and the fact that it's a year later and 
you know, we all thought it'd be two weeks and then we'd be back to normal. I, you know, I think um, people are quicker to, to snap for sure. Yeah, they are. And you see it on like in interviews, people are heated up. It, just we gave the example of Piers Morgan just sh flying off, like couldn't contain himself at all to end his career over uh, just, uh, over his feelings. Like I, my opinion, you have your opinions or opinion, which we're entitled to. And he certainly has his opinion. But if I was going to end, have a chat because you and I had a disagreement. And at the end of the day, we can't play in the same sandbox. I, I think there's a problem with people that can't rationally just sort of say, okay, let's rein it in here. And I'm not going to back down on my opinion of Meghan Markle. I think she's this, that, whatever. Or, but, but, he, but he didn't do that. And I find I see that a lot in stores when I do go out for a little bit. Or they're just ready to fly off at the cashiers. They're suddenly on a negative slant. And that's why I like to start off the show and you do every week in a positive note. Because we have to focus on all the positive things around us. There are some left. Even for all the negatives, we have to find a few of the positive things, right? Yeah, and, and you're so right. And, you know, and we've all got something going on. There's no question there. And and I, 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 feel, I feel so much for the people who are working retail, who are working fast food, who are working, you know, front lines, because they're dealing with all of the crotchety people and, you know, having to implement all of these um uh you know measures to keep everybody safe and people are are cranky about it and and then you know and i'm hearing story after story of them lashing out and i i just i feel awful for them because they're just trying to keep us going really and 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 maybe serve us a burger somewhere so anyway um we've got a great show lined up uh we've got some wonderful guests coming up and uh you know, we want to make sure that uh, you've grabbed a snack. I mean, I, I know I like to snack all day. So um, you, you want to make sure that you go out and grab a snack, maybe grab a little hot beverage, um, you know, and, and um, have a little break and then come on back because we absolutely know that you don't want to miss this show. Um, so I, you know, I'm thrilled to be here as always with my co-host Judy Loge, and we'll be back right after this break. Don't go too far. I am your host today, Veronique Garceau, and I'm joined by my ever wonderful co-host, Judy Loja. Yes, we're happy to be back for another segment. Yes, absolutely. And we have such a full show today. I'm so excited with our next two guests. Uh, but our yes. very first guest today is going to be uh, Sanden Kaloran, and he's joining us uh, from uh, the wonderful northern part of our province. And uh, welcome, Sanden. Oh, thank you very much. And it is wonderful. It's even, I think it was plus seven or eight today in Bathurst and Beldoon. So can't complain. It is a wonderful change from uh, last week in the windstorms for sure. <laughs> we'll take that it. Yes. Welcome. Nice to meet wicked. you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Welcome, Sandan. Thanks, Judy. Um, so Sandan, um, so you're here for a, a specific reason, uh, and that's to talk about uh, a new venture that you've launched um, uh, called Dockyard. But tell the viewers a little bit about you first, so that they can get to know you and you know, kind of say hi. Okay. Uh, so my name's Sandan Kalorn. I am 34 years old. I have a two-year-old named Jack. I'm married to a wonderful woman who is way out of my league, named Mallory, and uh, <laughs> we live. We live in Belle Dune. Uh, I was elected a, as a councillor, what's going to be five years ago, uh, come May. So, yeah, we got that extended term. So that was lots of fun. Uh, and Ooh. I've been working in uh, small businesses and uh, IT for the past 10 years since I graduated from Mount A. And it's been, uh, it's been a quite the adventure. And just uh, recently, I broke out onto my own to start a business accelerator and, and management consultancy firm called Dockyard Consulting. And uh, we just mm. opened up our office in Bathurst last week amidst the, uh, oh. the horrible windstorm. <laughs> you did it. Well, congratulations on your opening. And tell us yep. all about this um, initial upstart. Where did the idea for Dockyard come from, Sandin? Well, it's not an original idea by any stretch. Uh, I 
I've moved around a, a great deal through my entire childhood. I, I was born in Grand Prairie, Alberta, uh, and my my father and mom, who are both from the Beldoon area, uh, basically moved around chasing his career. He was uh, an oil and gas professional, so started out in Alberta, mm -hmm. lived in Newfoundland for a while, uh, Nova Scotia for the rigs off Sable, and you know all around and that entrepreneurial spirit was just kind of always what uh, my father gravitated to. So I was always surrounded by other entrepreneurs and, and people like that. So it's always kind of been in my blood. Uh, my grandfather was a potato farmer. So, I mean, Robert Cullen's potatoes were, were all over the North shore for a long time. So it's kind of been in my blood. And then when I was in Edmonton in 2014, I worked out of uh, an incubator called Startup Edmonton. So in New Brunswick, mm. we have Venn Innovation in Moncton, uh, and we have Planet Hatch in Fredericton. And all these great locations help entrepreneurs start up their businesses. So they give them support, make sure that they're, they're pursuing the right products and, and solutions to the problems that mm. the market is facing. They help them get their product yeah. off the ground. And I kept, I kept saying to myself, I'm like, geez, you know, these are really great initiatives, are really great centers, and it's, it's great to work there. The spirit is just amazing wow, could we ever use those in rural northern New Brunswick? Because yeah. like, t take, take the challenge of starting a business, which is already immense, and then compound that by the fact that, you know, you've got two kilometers between each house and a small population to mm -hmm. deal with and stuff like that. Like, that's really where I, I thought it could do the most good. And since yeah. those are mainly government-sponsored not-for-profits, uh, there just didn't seem to be any appetite for the government to come and set one up. So I took it upon myself. I, I've been pushing for the last two years, uh, kind of trying to figure out mm -hmm. if there was a way to get, you know, any kind of like system implemented in rural uh, New Brunswick. And it just, it wasn't happening. So I, I took it upon myself to just form the company, uh, take the lease out on a, on a beautiful space, on the fifth floor of uh, the Keystone Building in Bathurst, we have lots. We have thirty mm -hmm. five hundred square feet of a breakout space and offices, and uh, we're we're mm -hmm. going. We've kicked off our our training programs already, and we have our our big accelerator program coming out in April. So, hopefully, we can do what uh, all those other communities have been able to benefit from for so long, and uh, really start an entrepreneurial renaissance in uh, Northern New Brunswick. Well, that sounds really exciting, really wonderful news to hear that, you know, you've, you've landed on the right spot and you're going to take it from here. And I know it's going to be a wonderful asset to our whole region. That's just fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you look at uh, the great work that's going on in the Miramichi with uh, with the mayor, Adam Lord, and has always been really involved and and proactive in, in those kind of initiatives. Uh, Startup Miramichi has a little co-working space, so it, it's kind of close to the same vein. It's offering a little bit of the services. So mm -hmm. ours is kind of just taking that, uh, for any of your viewers that are familiar with that space, taking it that step further by making sure that there's constantly professional consulting services there to help mm -hmm. businesses you know, take that next step. Uh, last week, we had an interview with Richard Salion uh, about uh, the role that entrepreneurs can play in a renaissance in our northern economy. And we're going to be continuing to do uh, expert Q and A's like that and bringing in resources for, for people. So uh, it, it's, it just takes energy. And I, I think uh, the nice thing about being still in my early thirties for at least one more year uh, is I've got it to burn. Yeah. So it's, it's great. It, it sounds great. amazing. Um, talk to us a little bit about the services that you offer. You touched on uh, some training, you touched on, touched on yep. some consulting, but talk to us about, you know, what a business would find when they come to see you. So a uh, business can come in and start dealing with Dockward and Dockyard in a number of ways. Uh, one is through our pre-flight course, which is really designed for those early stage companies who are, you know, just working on the idea or are in their first or second year, and they're not really making a lot of money yet. You know, we, we really bring them through and make sure that they're offering the right product and marketing it or positioning it the right the right way or, you know, do the due diligence and tell them really get out before you spend too much money on this because this is not it just isn't going to fly, which unfortunately is something some people need to hear. Uh, 
They could also come in on our Accelerate program, which is a 12-week program where we pair them with a mentor and they, they really go, this is, you know, really work on scaling their business. So that could include developing into a new market, uh, reaching out and digitizing some parts of their product offering or service offering so that they can sp spread out from just delivering it in their local market to all across the world. So those are the types of things that we, we do on the training side. Uh, as a management consulting firm, we're also there to help businesses one-on-one -on -one if they want to, you know, digitize any of their operations. We have a background there. If they want to be able to, you know, develop a new marketing strategy for, you know, it, it can be locally or it can be, you know, maybe they want to start selling into a certain area of the states. Well, we can help them develop that go-to-market strategy down there connect mm -hmm. them with uh, consul generals and stuff like that and kind of lay that groundwork for them so that you can take away some of that guesswork because I think half of the time when people have great ideas or, or initiatives, they, they're looking for a roadmap that just isn't there. And maybe okay. just someone, and, and there is no clear roadmap to success. It takes a lot of effort, hard work, more hard work, and you know ultimately probably a few failures before you get there. But as long as you have mm -hmm. someone, and that was the, the beauty of what I saw in these startup spaces all over the country, as long as you kind of have this ecosystem where people are there rooting for you, they're supporting you, they're cheering for you, and that, that competition gives a way to you know, collaboration and support, that can make all the difference. And if we can help, I, I like to say it, if we can help 10 businesses uh, get to the point where they're employing 40 people, you know, we you know growing some businesses to that point well then we've just offset the loss of the smelter right so we can help modernize and diversify the economy around here and hopefully make it a little more resilient because one of the things that uh, i've been talking about as we're approaching hopefully the light at the end of the tunnel for covid is that we never really felt in the north the effect of the smelter closure because it was bang they had a little they had their severance and then it was uh, COVID and then everybody got the CERB. So we're, we're kind of on the precipice here. It's like, yes, on one hand, we're very happy to be mm -hmm. getting out of COVID really soon. But on the other hand, when all that support runs out, what's going to be left, right? So hopefully we can get started right. and get some businesses up and going. Mm -hmm. How does the business actually go about reaching you, Sandan, your services? Yeah, so How do we, they go? Uh, yeah, thanks, Judy. Uh, obviously, we're on on social media, and the the king of social media in New Brunswick is still Facebook. Uh, so they can find us facebook.com forward slash dockyardca. Uh, dockyard.ca is our website. All of our contact info is there, and uh, I do have the distinction of being the only Sandin I've ever met. So uh, a quick Google uh -huh. search of my name uh, will, you know, usually connect you to me. So that's. Uh, it's a it's a safe bet mm -hmm. that you'll run into me. So that's uh, that's probably the easiest way to. And, yeah. And people can, yeah. If they if they hit our site, they can book a free consultation with me, uh, just to talk about what they're what they're thinking about. We uh, a couple of days ago, I had a really nice chat with a, an up and coming keto bakery, and they were wondering about how they could get more orders in. And, you know, we were talking about you know well how many you know keto carrot cakes can you fit in your oven and stuff like that and we were you know we were taking the some high business concepts and bringing them down to you know the nuts and bolts of local entrepreneurs and mm -hmm. that's that's probably the most rewarding thing that i get to do is i get to share that knowledge and uh you know apply it to the mm -hmm. the day in day out activities of the people around here that are trying to make uh, a go of it excellent yeah. yeah, I love it. I, I wish uh, I wish you had been around when I had my business all those years ago, because although I had uh, been in business uh, and run other people's business for a lot of years, it, it definitely would have uh, I would have benefited from your support for sure. Um, you mentioned briefly, you know, that light at the end of the tunnel with COVID coming hopefully to an end sooner rather than later. But how are how are you making it work with COVID? You know, I mean, everything's gone so virtual these days. And you know, how's that working for an, a, a company like yours? Well, uh, thankfully, like we have uh, an arrangement with a, a curriculum provider out of Austin, Texas. That uh, so part of our training is is an online platform, and people go through that. Uh, we pick that particular curriculum out of a bunch of other accelerator curriculums because mm -hmm. it's so pliable to different scenarios. So 
we start all of our progresses online. So that that's great that way. Uh, it's also one of the reasons we picked such a big space to start with. Like if I were to give that advice to a business, uh, a, a new startup, I would say start small and scale. Uh, we picked a big space so that we could have social distancing inside of it. So we're running classes at about half of what we would like to, but inside the inside the, the big common area, we are able to maintain six feet of social distancing, different desks, and keep everybody uh, safe during the time that they're there. So that's a nice part of it. Mm. Uh, but ultimately, mm. I, I give the same advice to everybody is that, yeah, it's COVID right now, but the, the entire pandemic has given given us at least a little bit of a gift in the sense that we do have some time to gear up for what's going to be a completely new game on the other side. And now is the time to basically plant seeds, right? Sow seeds and reap it when it yep. comes. So I mm -hmm. anybody, like, now is the time to really hone your craft so when the green light hits that you can go, you can hit the ground running. Right. Sandan, what are some of the challenges that are faced when it comes to rural versus urban communities? I think a big, big challenge is obviously in, in New Brunswick in particular is the out migration of young people. Uh, when you lose as much of the young population in uh, in northern cities like Miramichi and like Bathurst, Camelton, uh, Trackady, Karakat, when you start losing that many young people, you kind of almost lose that that innovative spirit. Uh, you know, necessity is the the mother of all invention, is what Plato said, and that is completely true. So when young people are here, well, they want new things, they want new services, they want new careers. When they're not here, that becomes pretty tough. Uh, Richard Saliano says that it's uh, we're we're re are we're mining silver gold, which just means retirees' uh, wealth is what's keeping the economy going right now, and that can't last forever, obviously. So it, mm. it becomes a little bit challenging, uh, especially in, in rural areas to attract uh, the talent that you need, uh, get, especially in an IT sector. Uh, we're mm. sector agnostic. We don't we don't we'll work with uh, with everybody from janitors to biotech companies that we just want to see economic development. But when you start losing your workforce, it becomes tougher and tougher. And rural areas with not having the same level of access to education, training, and uh, the diversity of the workforce and people and, and, and perspectives, it does make it more mm -hmm. challenging. So it's, it's even more important that organizations exist and, and conversations like this occur where we can kind of share different perspectives and, and bring in new ideas because they're, we're never going to reinvent the wheel in New Brunswick. I, I, at least I don't think so. We have the potential to, but it, it probably won't happen, but there are ideas out there that if we were to adopt them, tweak them, uh, we could, we have the work ethic and, and, and the people around here that we could make a real go of it. It's just finding mm -hmm. good ways to have those conversations. And this is kind of a cool show yeah. about that. Yeah, it is. It's a great way to get word right out mm -hmm. there. And, and we're so pleased with the information, right, Gurney? Absolutely. And so in, a, in our last little bit before we go to break, um, in about a minute or so, what's that number one thing that you want everybody to know out there about Dockyard and and uh, and, um, and and about you? Uh, number one thing, about, I'll start with Dockyard. Uh, the number one thing that everyone should take away uh, about Dockyard is just that we, we're not there to, you know, we, we, we're not going to check boxes like we're not bureaucrats like so. Ultimately, our success it will be dependent on the success of the businesses we work with. If we if we work with a number of businesses and they fail or they they don't default on their loan or you know some government policies you know I'm going to give you a big tax break and when the tax break's gone they leave. Well, the government you, you don't see many bureaucrats heads roll like that. We're privately operated. Our our, our livelihood is going to be based on the success of the people we work with, and I think that's something that the North really needs to embrace is that we are in this together right mm -hmm. now. And if we don't start chalking up some wins, we'll miss the proverbial playoffs, I suppose. And, uh, and who knows what'll happen after that. So, I mean, that's, that's a big thing. And regardless of what you think the issue in your business is, and nobody runs a perfect business, so there's always something. Uh, we, 
we not only have a lot of expertise inside of our network in the dockyard, so there's there's myself and four other employees, and then we have a network of mentors outside of that. Uh, but we also have connections across uh, across Canada, across Atlantic Canada in particular, that we can connect people with if they want to uh, to keep going. Uh, and in mm-hmm. terms of uh, something to know about me is that I'm a real malcontent. Uh, I won't be happy uh, no matter what. So if you want someone who's going to push you uh, to do better and to and to keep going and reach your potential, I'm probably that guy. And I, <laughs> I, I, I de- this is, I grew up all over Canada and Northern New Brunswick was the place that we always came home to in the summer. It's the only home I've had. I chose to stay here and I chose to come back too. And I am giving it as much of my best shot, I guess, at trying to make it a place where other people can have that choice too. So I'm hoping love that it. Uh, we're successful in that. I love it. Well, you know, a huge thank you to you for coming on and for uh, talking to us about Dockyard. Um, I know that there are a lot of businesses out there and people who are thinking about business that are absolutely going to need your services. So um, don't go too far, everyone. We're going to grab a quick break. Our uh, next guest is coming right up, but a huge thank you to Send In uh, for joining us today and talking to us about Dockyard. All right. Thank Thank you guys so much. Hi, and welcome back to Have a Chat. I am your host today, Veronique Arsenault, and I am joined by my ever-beautiful co-host, Judy Loja. <laughs> Thanks, Veronique. You're such a sweetheart. I noticed, and I'm not trying to be vain, but I've noticed lately, I think it's just from lack of sleep with the time change and everything, and maybe the long winter months with not enough sun, that I'm weary looking. I like like the bags are growing under here, and I'm trying to find little remedies to to ease up on these little sacks right here that everyone gets sooner or later in life. I guess I've reached that age. Worst things in life than bags under your eyes, let me tell you. Yeah, you look gorgeous, but I know that feeling, those little Gucci bags that we got carrying on under here. I totally understand. I've got the same same feeling lately, but uh, you, you, you look beautiful as ever, so don't even worry. No, there's lots more things to worry about than that. That's for sure. We have so much going on and there are so many people that are around me. I know we're an age population because we're here in Miramichi, of course, uh, where Veronique and I reside, for those viewers that aren't sure of that by now. But we have lived here for a long, well, all of my life, and many of Veronique's, she's lived here. So um, just that, yeah, there's a lot of people that have very serious ailments right now. And so I try to catch myself when I make even a minor complaint and think, look at that person, what they're going through. And if they can endure that and treatments of cancer and and all, and and you know, bedridden and all of that, then I, I try to learn to say, okay, think about it before you unload about a bad hair day or whatever. I've said that so many times. We are so blessed. Over the last few weeks, we kind of had that start of um, what we thought was going to be a, a pretty significant outbreak here in the region. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, I think it probably induced a little bit of panic in, in all of us. Um, I don't know, you know, I, I, I mean, you and I talk every day, so we, we talk about that kind of stuff, but, um, you know, I know that for myself and, and I'm, I'm pretty careful. I, you know, I wear my mask everywhere I go. I, I have a little disinfectant on my keychain, and, and to be honest Mm -hmm. with you, I don't go out very often, um, and haven't for the last year, but, um, I, you know, did start to have a little bit of that oh no feeling because I, I had been to, you know, quite a few of the places that they had talked about where there was possible exposure and, and all of that stuff. So it, mm-hmm. it kind of, it, it, it caught me a little bit and I had a little bit of that um, nervousness about it. Of course we did. And that's why we take things for granted and we say, oh, you know, wearing our mask, but are we often wearing it properly? Are, are we, are, is it sealed so that, you know, if you are around somebody that you may, um, be later informed that has possibly transmitted that virus. Did you did you take precaution? Did you wash your hands actually very well when you left the store, or at least uh, desan- you know put the sanitizer on? And when you got home again, 
you start thinking, did I, did I, and questioning yourself, and it really pushes it back into your mind that anything is possible, that like we were doing so well in zone seven, uh, particularly in Miramichi, that it was a, a, a wow when this little outbreak occurred. But it really reined us into being myself personally much more vigilant, even I already was, but even up to my game on sanitization and sterility and all that stuff around the house, outside. Uh, but, you know, uh, it's it's a shame when people do get that COVID virus, that people look at them like they're some kind of pariahs, that they're some kind of a leper, that, that oh my gosh, you know, they're forever going to be around us and infecting. That's, that's just cruel. People are very quick to point fingers and they could have picked that up themselves. These people are saying, oh, why would they have, you know, been there or brought someone in that you know what i mean they're they're passing judgment when we ourselves could be ones that have picked it up and are carrying it and we're and we're almost criticized for carrying an illness and it's just like any any other flu or cold in that we can mm -hmm. catch it anywhere and you're right that right. that stigma that's kind of developed around uh covid and you know oh my goodness we have a case here well you know what it was yeah. it was likely to happen you know it was likely to happen for sure and so it, it was interesting. I, because of course I had a little bit of that worry because I had been out and about uh, a little bit. Um, I decided to go to the mass testing clinic, and um, mm -hmm. you know what an experience that was because I wasn't quite sure. I'd heard yeah. I had heard lots of stories about, you know, the the test itself, and it looked so uncomfortable putting that that Q tip like swab kind of up the nose and everything. Um, mm -hmm. So I was, you know, I was a little apprehensive. I will admit. <laughs> Um, but you know, dad is always up for, for whatever it is that I pitch his way. So on Saturday we decided, um, you know, we knew that it would probably be a little bit quieter at the mass testing clinic by Saturday afternoon. Mm -hmm. So we did go Saturday afternoon, um, you know, and yeah. it was so well done and it was amazing to see all of the people that were working there. And, um, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, we were in and out in 15 minutes and, and I'll tell, yeah. I'll tell the viewers a little bit about what it was like to, to have the test yeah. done. Um, you know, yeah, you do uh, that. You do you that. Yes, I know. You give that description. Um, <laughs> oh gosh. Well, and it was, you know, I was really uptight about it. I will say that. But I, you know, I sat down, and and Dad was at the table beside me, and and Dad had had a COVID test done, like way right right in the beginning of the pandemic, because we were trying to get him um, between countries. He was traveling back and forth at that time for work, um, not coming into Canada, but he was traveling um, throughout Europe. So. Um, dad had had it done, so he knew what to expect. But for me, I, you know, I sat down and, and, um, <clears throat> I, I still had my mask on and the, the RN, the nurse <clears throat> at the time said, you know, just, it, it could make you sneeze. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah. and she said, or it could make you cough. So just kind of keep your mask down around your, you know, your mouth. And then, and then we're going to do the swab. And I said, okay. And she said, you know, I'm going to put it, I'm going to put it up there. And she said, um, it may make you, you know, your eyes water. And she said, it'll probably, probably not feel great. So anyway, she was lovely as, as was everybody around me. So mm -hmm. I, you know, it was all tensed up and ready for that. So, um, so first of all, what surprised me was actually how tiny the swab is like, as far, like, like yeah. around, like it was just a tiny, I was yep. picturing like a full on, I don't know, Q-tip showing <laughs> up my nose. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, it was a tiny little, tiny little Q-tip uh, like swab thing, and it was long, right? So I thought, oh no, she's gonna touch my brain for sure. Um, and there's not, you know, know, there's not much up there that I that I want her taken out. Oh, right? stop. Um, stop. But you know what it felt like, and it, it, you know, that feeling when you jump in the pool and you get water up your nose. Yeah, that's what it did. That's what it felt yeah. like. Yeah, that's what it felt like. Yeah, yeah. So and it was in and out. She right when I got that feeling, she was already pulling the swab out. So. You know, it was instantaneous. Mm -hmm. They were so, so lovely to, to deal with. And, you know, and then, and I, and I had that feeling of wanting to sneeze to kind of get the, get the water out of my nose, get that feeling out. But yeah, you know what, yes. in and, out, and it was over with. And then within 24 hours, I had the results back and they were negative. And, you know, so it, it, it did Wonderful. ease my mind because, you know, you wake up that you wake mm -hmm. up one morning, you're like, oh my goodness, I have a headache. It must be COVID, yeah. <laughs> you know, or a cough or a little cough or something like that. But I want to give a big shout out, out to public health because let's just face it, that is a lot, a lot. I think there were uh, roughly uh, within three days or two and a half days, Thursday, Friday, and half of Saturday, 1,600 tests uh, given out and swabs taken. And, and like I said, we had one case, uh, one positive come back in all that time and all those tests. 
of, of, of a connection from another case. So that's pretty amazing, really. And to, to have them deal with that day in and day out, they're exposed as well, you know, even though they have their masks on and they're well prevented as far as they can be. But to, to deal with children, you know, to, to swab children and, and little kids that are nervous and, and adults of needles and to have old people who are very uptight about it, not having experienced it and not knowing, as you described, just what to expect. And there was an interview of a little girl that had Tourette's syndrome uh, and here the public uh, health nurse is trying to give her the swab take the take the covid swab and the little girl with the Tourette's cap because of her um you know her her body movement and um mm -hmm. jerking motions kept it was a back and forth for a good 6 to 7 minutes and and the nurse yeah, was so beautifully kind about it, understanding this little girl's condition and her syndrome and the girl was so positively trying to be happy about getting and cooperating the test that just like in out oh let's get it done they they come across some pretty um what can i say not so pleasant situations you know where people are ill and just one more thing that an older person might have to go through not the seniors thankfully our seniors that are in the nursing homes have been tested i know there are still many seniors in the community that have not been and i cannot wait for these vaccines to myself be given out so that we can start traveling again they're interacting again and I'm going to be really honest, Veronique. I I can't wait to start doing my public engagements again. I am really missing that. Yeah, yeah, and I and I'm I'm much like you, Judy. I'm missing that um, that drive that I get from being out in public with people and attending yeah. events and emceeing events and participating in events and yes. and getting to volunteer at events. Like it, mm -hmm. I'm missing that absolutely. Mm -hmm. And and I think um, you know. For me, that's what's been the longest part of this year is, um, you know, making sure that I that I'm okay in that, you know, because I I get so much energy from being out like that, and and so you know to have such a dramatic shift in my life over the last year and your life, I know that too. Um, you know, I'm really looking forward to, um, yeah, to to getting out and doing that all over again. So I, I totally understand. But I really run, I've understood uh, one thing in this past year is I really do much better under pressure. I work much better under stress than not having a, a, you know, a system going. If I have to do um, a full day of mentoring youth and then I have to do an engagement that evening, I have to come back and prepare something for the next day, I get it all done. What I have been finding is that in this last year, I could have been doing so many more little things for example, sorting and maybe getting rid of things and doing things within the house, like even though it's organized, there's so much more to organize. But I, I just felt like I was not motivated to do that. But if I had mm -hmm. a 24 hour day and had uh, a 13 hour full on schedule, I would probably get that done and then some. If that if that's just the way I operate. Yeah, Strange. no, I, I I'm much the same. I I have not achieved mm -hmm. any of those things that I thought. Oh, if I only had the time, I would do. Um, I right. have, I've not. I've not. I've not done it. I've not organized. I've not cleaned. You know, oh. I've. I've just. Yeah. I've just kind of um, existed for the last year. Now, I will say this because, yeah. you know, I, I've seen a lot of posts on social media where they're saying, you know, you're, uh, especially people who uh, tend not to be uh, pro-vaccination um, or mm -hmm. who feel like perhaps you know COVID has been overblown. Um, you know, I've, I've often seen the posts where it said, you know, people are so afraid of dying that they've put a year off of living that they haven't lived for the last year. I will say this though. So I, I haven't lived in the, in the last year, the same way that I normally would have. I wouldn't have gone to, you know, 50 or a hundred events in the last year. I haven't volunteered in a lot of places. I haven't, you know, um, helped set up or, or run a lot of festivals, but I will say this, mm -hmm. I, I have, I have had a fantastic year and made some wonderful memories with those who are closest to me. Right. And, and I don't regret having been able to spend that time with those people. So I have lived a very full life. It's been a very different life, but I've lived a very full life the last year with some mm -hmm. adjust oh. adjustments to my, to the way that I perceive a full life to be right. Cause you, you think, Oh, if you're busy mm -hmm. and you're, and, and people want to spend time with you and you're, you know, you're always on the run, then, then your life is great. But um, I've had a great year in a lot of ways and, and wouldn't have 
yeah. wouldn't give that up for a lot of, you know, for, for most of it. Although I'm tired of it now and uh, tired of COVID yeah. and, and want to get back to a little bit of more normalcy. Mm -hmm. But I just want to give some hope to those people that are out there feeling like they are in a funk. And if they're not normally a person that experiences any form of depression, anxiety, um, poor mental health, that even if you're feeling off, that's normal because I've felt off and I've never experienced depression in my life. And I don't tend to, I'm a highly excitable person. I get anxious if there's something to worry about, but I'm not anxiety prone as far as you know, having that to deal with and, and that, that panic attack kind of sensation that so many people describe. But I do find that everyone I talk to seems to be, I'll, I'll use that word, in a funk, in a funk. They're just, yep. they're just kind of floating from day to day, routine to routine, waking up, doing the little things, just getting on with their day, going to bed, getting up, doing the same thing. And so that variety Absolutely. is not there. But again with, again, with yourself, my own family, I've not seen our oldest son since last November. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to mm -hmm. reunite with him. I just like everybody else do feel like I'm in a bit of a funk as well. Um, I'm, I'm a little off, right? Cause it's not quite yeah. how I would normally feel. Normal. So yeah, I get that part. Yeah. I get that part for sure. But you know what, there's a light at the end of the tunnel and, and um, you know, we just got to figure out what that looks like for us when, when the time comes and, you know, do we, do we run back to, you know, the, the 18 hour days on our, you know, running from, from here to there, I know. or do we kind of have a balance between the two where it's, you know, partly we've slowed down a little bit and partly we get our, you know, our juice from everything that we're doing in the community. So it's, you know, it's hard to know, mm. but I mean, Hey, that's, we're going to figure it out. Right. I can't wait to travel. I, I can't wait to travel and start, yeah. and I'm going to just pack a little suitcase and have it standing by the door as an incentive to to really uh, get my excitement level up when when we're further along. And I really personally think it will be probably another year. Do you think before we're able to travel again or what? What what do you um, feel before, yeah, before we're able to all? Before yeah. we're able to go too far, I think so. I think we'll be able to travel a little bit more across the country, um, you know, in the fall. But I think any real big travel um, other than that will probably be a while. But anyway, listen, we're wrapping up the show. It was such a great opportunity to, to uh, chat today. We had a little bit of um, technical diff difficulties with our guest um, that was supposed to be on this segment. So it did give Judy and I an opportunity to spend some time uh, together ch chatting about how we're doing and, and with all of you. So Anyway, a huge thank you to our guest that was on previously, SNDN. What a great uh, initiative he's got going mm. up there in Bathurst. And uh, looking forward to what's to come. So everybody have a great week from Judy and I. And uh, tune in again to have a chat. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.